Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, for me, I, I love cooking. I love food, and the medium can change. So the, sometimes it's books, sometimes it's TV, sometimes it's restaurant. But if you love your, your, your field and you're lucky, like me, to be able to hang, hang around a lot and, 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 <laughs> and be curious, uh, you love what you do. You should just take it. I mean, I, I, I'm not good at anything else, so I should just keep doing <laughs> this. Seems like you've done okay for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you are, at least speaking of your television ventures, you're the host and I believe the executive producer of yeah. No Passport Required, uh, which is on PBS. You can see it here on WGBH. And tell us a little bit about that show because it's more than food. It's about yeah. food, but not just about food. No, it's really a, a, a passport. It's really a beautiful portrait, hopefully, of a city that we love, but also that immigrant culture into that city that added so much value that you may or may not know. So in Houston, for example, you know, Houston is one of the most diverse cities in the country. People may not know about that. And also, it also is the home of the, the largest Nigerian West African population in the country. Would not have known no. that. No. So hopefully the city finds out, finds out a little bit more about themselves um, and there's a level of surprise there. In Los Angeles, we, we focused on the Armenian community. And think about such a big city like Los Angeles. There's with so many different cultures on top of each other. And then there's Glendale and Little Armenia that is just such an incredible place. So it's, you know, you want to be a traveler. You want to inspire travel. You want to inspire food conversation. Here in Boston, we focused on the overlap between the Cabardian, the Brazilian, and the Portuguese, right? Okay, what I thought was interesting, I have lived here much of my life. Um, I am aware that there is a, a Portuguese yeah. population here. There are Portuguese restaurants. There's all, there are all kinds of festivals. I was aware of the Cape Verdean population, aware of the Brazilian population. What I was not aware of is that Portuguese is the number three language yeah. in Massachusetts. That was, that was a surprise. Unbelievable, right? And you know, sometimes also it's about history and dealing with history and going back in order to move forward. And when you do a deeper dive, you realize there's, like all of us, you know, food and culture and history, it's complex. Mm -hmm. But it could also be delicious, it could also be rewarding, it could also be an, an entry point for conversation. And I think in a moment like now, where uh, this country really, we need to talk more to each other, we need to learn more about each other's differences and what could be better than over, you know, over some food, uh, learning about a culture that may or may not be yours, but it all belongs in America. And I just think that's why No Passport is so important. That's why the show is so important. Uh, one of the places you visit is Fall River, about yeah. an hour south of Boston, where there is a vibrant Portuguese community. Mm -hmm. And you visited a place called Portugalia, yeah. which is a marketplace. It's a beautiful marketplace. and. Uh, these places, these windows, these mom and pop, they're also a vision of hard label, but also a dream. And sometimes just as simple as, I want to hold on to my culture. There's a family business that started out in a garage as a specialty store, only selling bacalhau, the salted codfish, but now grown as a family business, second generation, into you know s several blocks. And it's not just bacalhau and food. It is that, but it's also about Portuguese olive oil and wine and, and uh, beautiful fabrics. And it just shows you that this big idea, small idea, can become the big idea. And uh, if food and culture puts food on the table, gets kids through college, it's such a central part of both jobs, but it's also more than anything, it's, it brings communities together. And this baklava, am I pronouncing it correctly? No, 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 baklava, now another part no, of the world. that's something else. Baklava. Baklava. Yeah, baklava, yeah. Baklava. yeah. I, we can show our audience yeah. baklava. We have a clip from Portugalia in Fall River. I grew up with this. I know this salt flavor. I know it, I know it. It's familiar. These are, these are shreds, bits, so trimmings. That's that's a, a pollock. This is, this is uh, the, the cheeks. Yeah. So... And then these are the faces. Mm -hmm. The Portuguese aptly named it the fiel amigo, meaning the faithful friend. 
because they could depend. You could always depend on salt cod. You, yeah. you look at Literally. Portugal in the country or in the yeah, interior; yeah, right. they didn't have access to, to fresh products. Yeah. You're talking years ago, so so that you could always have sheets of this in your pantry. How long can this hold? A very long time. There's no. I mean, you can honestly, hold the, the cod fish in your fridge. You can for for two years and no problem. Yeah. Bacalhau, probably the dish that is sort of the biggest impact of Portuguese food, right? So the Portuguese come up with this technique that is you hang it and then you salt cure it. And the kind of a mix between air drying it and salt curing it creates this super strong flavor. So when you get it, you got to soak it. Maybe for a day, you just rinse the water. And then it comes back up alive in a different way. The texture gets almost bouncy. Bacalhau is a flavor enhancer. You can put it into a stock, and all of a sudden, you get that salty, fishy flavor. People all over the world are using bacalhau, all the way up into northern, northern Norway, to the Azores, Brazil, Cap Verde. You know what I think is amazing? You know, the world goes so much faster, right? But something like this, a tradition that is like 1,000 years old, people are still using. I love that, you know what I mean? Like, this is very old world. Yeah. yeah. How have you seen the Portuguese community change over the years? There was a time, you know, there was sure. this assimilation time. Assimilation, there was, yeah. and there was this sort of, you know, uh, I, you know, identity yeah. crisis in my Don't Portuguese and my not. There were the generations before us who the parents insisted that their kids only speak English. You know, they in the house, household they spoke Portuguese amongst themselves. But I would just say that that's gone. I mean, yeah. it was a, a proud moment for us to open this market when we have customers walking in for the first time. Some of them would choke up even, or yeah. give us a hug, and feel like that they were responsible in some way to, for this, for to this. to the culture. I mean, yeah. people are very, very proud. You know, Ronaldo, yeah. Mourinho, <laughs> uh, Portugal, you know, there's a lot of different reasons to be proud. And, and this market is part of that story. You were there the winter, Marcus, huh? It was so cold. <laughs> I think you've got to make a return trip maybe this year. Yeah, OK, I will do that. No, but it was a beautiful place. And yes, it's beautiful yeah. on the water there. Yeah. It's so interesting what Michael from Portugalia said about the language and embracing the language, embracing the culture in in a deeper way or a more overt way than maybe he once had. Yeah, I mean, as immigrants, when we come, very often parents or yourself, you just want to assimilate. So you just hold on to English. And then maybe that goes on, on the behalf of your own culture a little bit. So I think this back and forth is always first generation, second generation is a back and forth. But you do realize at the point that to be American, the beautiful thing about being American is that you can hold on to both or all three or all four, whatever is as a family. And that's what makes America so unique. And it's important in this time and day and age that we remember that and that we celebrate our diversity. Our uniqueness is because of our diversity, not uh, anything else. And yet there are these commonalities. I mean, the salted fish is one of the commonalities. The, I, I think what people may not have understood from that clip is he's taking you through this marketplace. You see it. And you get very excited yeah. because you recognize it from your childhood Absolutely. in Sweden, which has nothing to do with but Portugal. We're, we're living in such a fast time and high technology time, so we're almost uh, taken away from the roots, what makes us, right? Like, preserving fish makes sense, especially in a place like Boston where you're on the water, right? That's a natural route, although the majority of people probably don't know how to do it anymore, right? So, I guess. so it's nice to see that certain culture has kept it and we're the caretaker of that, yeah. right? Uh, especially the islands where they come from also, where the majority is fishing. Mm -hmm. And um, the Bacalhau lived in all the Portuguese speaking countries, right? So that's where you see the overlap between Brazil, Cabo Verde, and Portugal, right? All dishes do not live in all three countries but the salted cod has been kept in all three countries. That's it. And, and that's other amazing. countries. And that, yeah. That's also as well. And also think it has to do with the fact that it has, it's cured. And you know, this comes from way before pre, of course, refrigeration. So right. people can hold on to something. 
Yeah, we talk about traditions. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from our audience here at the uh, BPL studios. Uh, Marcus, if you could go to any country and eat their native food for a month, what country would it be? Wow. Uh, Great question. I, I love a place like Japan because it's so much, Japan is about 15 different cuisine and I've just scraped the, started to scrape the surface so that I would, I would learn a lot, you know, between the different noodle traditions, between sushi, between all the different cuisines that we know of Japanese food. Not, and you're saying not just one kind of sushi, one, but multiple kinds of sushi. And, and, and Japan has 15 legit cuisines that, that sushi is one of them, maybe the most known one, but then you have teppanyaki, you have sukiyaki, you have all of these different layers. So it's a chamber of work and, and good food. Great follow-up question here, also from our audience. Uh, what food will you not eat? Uh, I would say food that is not cooked with passion. Mm. Like, you have to have, cooking something, it's really, you're trying to say something. I love you, I care about you, uh, this is who we are, this is our, our grandparents' birthplace, whatever it might be, you're trying to say something. The food that is just slapped on, I'm not interested. I'd rather don't eat. So it doesn't matter what kind of cuisine, it's what goes into it. Not at all, because I'm, I know if it's from a place that I don't know anything about, oh, I'm so excited because that's new and this is even better, like a no passport. We learn about eating uh, in Nigeria, something called swallow culture, when you eat the fufu and the pounded yams, and then you pour this fish stew on top of it, but the fish stew has lots of bones in it. So normally I would like, pick out the bones. No, you have to pick it up, put those two in mouth and swallow. And you're swallowing fish bone. And that's kind of hard for the first time, but that's the culture and you gotta yeah. do it. So yeah. it, it seems like this, that I've cooked all over the world, but I still have so much to learn. That's what's incredible. And, yeah. and, and, and in this show, in No Passport Required, you're right in there, yeah. in the kitchen, all kinds of kitchens. And you don't take over, right? You you seem I as much- over. I don't know this stuff, which is awesome. Like. You have to understand, as a chef, it's your dream scenario when you don't know what's going on. Not when you do know what's going on, because you can learn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you talked about uh, preparing food with passion, and I, a friend of mine just said this. She said her own cooking. She said, I think I've been cooking lousy meals lately. And I said, oh, I'm sure you haven't been. And, and we, we were discussing it. She said, you know, I want to cook food that my family enjoys because you know, food is love, yeah. which I think is what you just said. And then she had this theory that I thought was interesting. She said, maybe that's why we all love our mother's cooking, yeah. because it was made with love. Yes, absolutely. I, I have a twist on that. I love my mother, but my grandmother's food was better than my mother's food. She was your real mentor. Oh my God, my grandmother was the <laughs> hell I could throw down. And you know, just entering our house, was, there, was, there was always something, there was always like a stock, a stew in the back. There was always like fried fruit or pickled fruit going on on the table. There was like a bread either coming out of the oven, resting on top of the oven. This is like a mini Samuelson food factory, <laughs> right? And uh, no, I just, uh, we, me and my sister used to bike over at least three days a week just to eat with our, our grandmother. And do, do you still have like, as, as much food as you have cooked and eaten and as much knowledge as you have about food, do you still have a special place for that food, that Swedish food that you grew up with? Of course. With? I mean, pickled herring is amazing. And, uh, you know, you, I come from a fishing village, so knowing that this is also what kept my grandparents food on the table, literally. This is the profession. So it, it, it eats different when your family has come from that, right? It's not just the pickled herring. It's not that sour vinegar. It's really about this is something that provided food made, you know, this was our family tradition, family profession. That's really heritage yeah. too, right? That, yeah. that sort of, and that makes its way into your food today? It does, I mean, it, it's, uh, I love taking my son back to Sweden and, and uh, climate-wise how different it is, but also flavor-wise, right? So, you know, each season sets the tonality of the food, right? And he's so young now, but like eventually he will know that, that things in Sweden are a little bit saltier there, um, it might be more vegetables. It's very, you know, root vegetables like cabbage. Like it's a completely different way of enjoying food. More rustic, I would say. Uh, 
I want to let people know that uh, you can send your comments and your questions to us uh, from Marcus Samuelson via Facebook and Twitter. We can share them right here. Um, are you on both? Are you on? Are you? Are you Instagram? Are you on Twitter? Where are you? Where are you on? What do you? What, what's your? Oh, me favorite? personally. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I'm on Twitter mm -hmm. a lot for work. Yeah. Facebook here mm -hmm. and there. I'm terrible at all of them. I'm inconsistent. Yeah. Are you? I'm mostly uh, on Instagram. That's mm -hmm. really where I post what we do and stuff like that. Facebook as well, but I would say the most sort of a social thrust is on. Which What's your handle so people know? Marcus Cooks. Marcus Cooks yeah. on all on Instagram, yeah. on Twitter, on yeah. Facebook. Okay, so you can also find Marcus on social media. Which is nice. Um, one of the other places you visited for um, no passport required for the Boston uh, show was New Bedford. Yeah. And you connected with a woman of Cape Verdean heritage who is a singer. Her name is Candida Rosa, and yeah. you met up with her in a diner. Yeah, I mean she's amazing. She she sings in in. I mean, she's just a, an amazing singer, an amazing presence. And we had breakfast together, and it was great. And it was like, had some rice with Portuguese sausage. It was really good meal. And I think we have a clip of that. Oh, nice. So I'm meeting Candida Rose. She's amazing. American Cambodian singer at Izzy's, which is this cool little diner. Welcome to New Bedford. How are you? Oh, <laughs> what a nice, cozy place. This place, you're sort of right in the heart of where everything mm -hmm. is happening. What's good here? What should we be having? I know uh, they have Jag. What? Whoa, 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 what is that? It's so different configurations of yeah. rice and beans. I think here they do um, rice with kidney beans, mm -hmm. and, and uh, that's that's what I grew up with. But there's also types of Jagasida that is not yeah. rice, it's like um, some kind of milled corn. I think where you can taste both Portugal and West Africa the best is really in Jagasira. It has fried rice and beans. It has Portuguese sausages. This is hearty food, but it's also delicious. This is Jag for me. You know, I grew up in Gothenburg, which is a port town, so I grew up with some Cambodians, so I know about the culture a little bit. It's not a country that you hear that much about. What should we know about it? It's really a mixture of all of the influences from Portugal, from Africa. I mean, it's right in the shipping route in the Atlantic Ocean where the early explorers mm -hmm. were coming from. Then you had folks sort of stopping for fuel and sometimes staying. And so because we have all of this mixture, we all look different. I mean, the slave trade went through Cabo Verde. So actually, there's a city in Cabo Verde called Cidade Velha, mm -hmm. and it's the first trading post of slaves. Cape Verde was used almost as a teaching place oh, wow. for, for slaves before they ended up going to places like Brazil mm. or wherever else they went yeah. from there. So Cape Verde was definitely a huge piece. Yeah. And I don't think people really know and understand mm -hmm. how huge of a piece yeah. it was. Wow, poignant. That's, uh, we have a little feedback there. Yeah. Um, she really got into some of the, as you said before, complex, I think is the word you used, complex history. It's so hard to deal with history, and but it's important too, right? And from a perspective of today, we're so fortunate that cooking can bring us together. We can now talk about that sense of history, how difficult it was, but we can do it over a bowl of rice, mm -hmm. and and we know where, we came, where it came from, we know where we are today, we know where we're going. And, and maybe this is a moment for it. It seems like there's a wider lens, maybe a deeper lens, being cast on history and how what's happened in the past has created what exists currently. I mean, it's definitely connected. You know, I think that uh, each culture that comes here has a real why, right? And there's, it's a real deep reason why, whether it's Italian American community or Portuguese or, or Nigerian, the why is different. Mm -hmm. But it very often leads to America is this beacon of hope and big dreams. You might know. Well, I remember when I, I, you know, I came from Sweden, which is a very cushy, beautiful country. But I choose to come to America, and my why was because it was this beacon of hope and a dream. I can probably live out my dream more. So I didn't know if it would ever happen, but I better on that. So America projects this incredible sense of hope and and possibility to all over the world. So uh, that, this is one of the reasons why I came, and this is why I love America so much. 
And you presumably could have lived anywhere, right? You'd grown up in Sweden, yeah. born in Ethiopia. You had worked uh, around the around the globe. I lived in really. six countries. So yes. And plus the cruise ship life, yeah. right? So you really saw so much of the world. And then you come to New York and you end up in Harlem. Yeah. Uh, and and that's that's home. Yep. And definitely. Why? What is it about Harlem? I think Harlem is an amazing community. It's very rich on culture. Culture matters. You know, you walk on these blocks where. You know, Maya Angelou lived a couple of blocks away from us. Uh, James Baldwin wrote some of his best books 10 blocks away from me. Langston Hughes, you walk around, you have the Apollo on one side, Studio Museum, the Schomburg, these are institutions, but it's also people in these, in these homes that have held on to the tradition of, of Harlem and the migration, or if you go to the East Harlem, Side, you go over to El Barrio, where it's much more Latin flair. This is America. This is history. This is cool. This is where salsa was born. This is where jazz and gospel is fostered. You know what I mean? Like so, it's a beautiful community, a beautiful village in the middle of New York City. And your restaurant, Red Rooster, really pays sure homage, is. right? And, and because there was a Red Rooster before yeah. your Red Rooster. In the 40s and the 50s, and uh, I've been lucky enough to speak to Mayor Dinkins about this, because he used to go to the original Red Rooster. Wow, wow. And uh, again, we, I wanted to come up with a name that connected the past with the present and hopefully to the future. For me, it's about creating jobs. We have 180 jobs that we create at Red Rooster. Um, majority of them are for, for Harlemites. So you can, a restaurant means to restore a community. And a restaurant is best, really, it's a place where everyone is welcome and can provide jobs for. And, and I mean, and that's a trick, right? Because you, when you opened Red Rooster, you already had a name. You were a big deal chef in New York City. So people uh, of means who might frequent a restaurant downtown or up, uptown, downtown, uh, might come to Red Rooster. But it, it, how do you strike that balance of being a place for the community and then also bringing in other folks? I think it's about creating a delicious environment that is sticky, that people want to be around and feel welcome for everybody. Restaurants is not this place that is for the 1% of the 1%. Who came up with that, that idea? Although I think sometimes it feels that way, right? Well, absolu absolu absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And the people who want to do that, they should do that type of restaurant. <laughs> but I'm saying it is, restaurants have been around forever. The, the idea of somebody cooks and somebody pays for a meal and it creates this level of sense of community, that has been around for thousands and thousands of years. So for me, I worked so long for in, in Midtown, and it was very high end and very expensive. I was like, I've, I've tried everything that I need to try in that part, of, in that, in that forum, and I felt there was more of me. What else can I, can we do as a collective? How can I be more uh, community driven? And this was very much challenged by my mom because my mom's like, why does your restaurants always have to be expensive? You know, you didn't grow up with bankers. You grew up with school teacher, post office worker. Like, a, you know, just a normal middle class society. It's like, cook for those people. And that was really the driving, motivating force, really. Because you, I mean, you had achieved so much. I mean, you were, what, 24 when you got that New York Times three star? Yeah. I mean, you, you'd really been on that path. Of yeah, but I mean, it's cooking, if you're really into food, it's not a, it's not a victory lap and it's not a bus stop, you know what I mean? If you're curious, you constantly want to develop and, and evolve. And for me now, it's the job to create, my job is to create a table for the next generation and create a much more diverse environment. And so that's why, for me, it's important to have a restaurant that matters, work within something like, you know, Passport that really matters, you know, that, that, that hopefully um, reflects where we are as a country, where we're going, what are our opportunities, what are our possibilities. So you, you know, you wanna, you wanna create a more diverse table. And, and you also wanna create opportunity, right? Yes. Because restaurants, it's just so interesting, right? Restaurants, you, you, a lot of the chefs, are, there's a lot of men, right, in the industry, dominating the industry, but is that changing? A lot of, it's been it's tradition, not. yeah. What, what, what are the sort of dynamics that are happening? Well, I mean, we all know that women are the leading factors in food from birth to <laughs> impact of so many different things. Like I think about American food, Julia Chow. Right. Big, big conversation, Alice, Alice Waters, right? Who really, really, you could think about 
um, just major, major game changing. Uh, is always women has always been in center. If you look at um, in my community, Sylvia, you know Sylvia's restaurant, the most famous restaurant in Harlem, and started by Sylvia Woods in the '60s. So you know, I, I think about a restaurant like Duke Chase in New Orleans, where Leah, Leah Chase had she worked. She opened a restaurant in the 40s, and she just passed away, 96 years old, still cooked. Uh, civil, you know, she broke the law in order to serve a di dining room because she is, is one of the, you know, she served a dining room that was diverse, and that was breaking the law back then. So real game changing in cooking has always been women, and it will continue to be women. And, and also bringing in people of color. Mm -hmm. Again, probably an underrepresented demographic yeah. in kitchens. Especially at the higher levels. Well, it depends what era, because if you go back to American history, Thomas Jefferson, he had nothing but black cooks. <laughs> there you go. They were called something else then. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, about acknowledgement, and it's always been this dismissive of people of color when it comes to great work in all kinds of colors. And that for me is just nonsense. So I don't listen to that history. I, I mean, it, it happened, but you have to also walk with a level of, of clarity where you want to go, because you're going to be fed. You know, being from Africa, the luxury of coming from Africa has given me such a strength of another reality because great food, the birthplace of great food is in Africa, but it's always ripped away from Africa. Like, for example, if you bought, if you bought somebody a great box of Belgian chocolate, where in Belgium does the coca bean come from? It's from Africa. <laughs> You know, if you want to say, say, I'm going to have a great roast, I'm going to have great coffee, French roast or Italian roast. Yeah. There's no coffee beans in Italy or France. So greatness has always been ripped away from us. And that's why I always know that the history I read is not the real history. And the, I mean, the, so there's such a, such a parallel between your work in your restaurant, right, and your work yeah. on this show, really about um, looking at culture, looking at history, and yeah. food, yes. and the connections. Connection, absolutely. And, you know, this, this, in Ethiopia, America 100 years ago, all food was currency, right? Mm -hmm. You knew how much a pound of sugar costed in this country. In Ethiopia, you still know what a kilo of berbere or teff costs. So we very often removed from these things. And culturally, I think it's important today that bring a little bit of that back. Because it is important, because it does, does set you're connected to the earth in a different way when you know the value of a pound of flour. All right, let me put you on the spot. Favorite thing you had while you were in Boston filming the show? Uh, I think the mukeka, the fish stew I had, um, it's this beautiful restaurant between MIT and Harvard. It was absolutely amazing. Also the fish stew I had on the boat, fresh fish from the ocean, cooked half an hour later on the boat. That was pretty spectacular. You got to tune in. No passport required. Marcus, in the kitchen of yes. a boat. Yes. Not taking charge, just, just doing, doing what the fishermen say. Yes, right? absolutely. Right. You better. You better. <laughs> no Passport Required airs uh, next Monday. That's February 17th, 9 o'clock here on WGBH. Marcus Samuelson, what a joy to speak with you. Thank you so Thank much you so for much. coming by. Thank you. Thank you.